Jesus was crucified on Passover. In fact, the traditional Jewish practices performed every Passover seem to correlate perfectly with the events of our Master's death and resurrection. But if the spring festivals were prophetic hints of his first coming, what's the prophetic significance of the fall festivals? Today we're joined by D. Thomas Lancaster and Aaron Eby, and we're going to find out what the Jewish holy day of Rosh Hashanah tells us about the second coming, the final judgment, and the end of the world as we know it. Put your hand and mind together We will walk in harmony Let me introduce you to my teacher The rabbi from the Galilee You're listening to Messiah Podcast, where Jesus is Jewish and that changes everything. Messiah Podcast is a production of First Fruits of Zion. Well, welcome to Messiah Podcast. I'm Jacob Franzak, and I'm here with my colleagues, Aaron Eby, Senior Educator with First Fruits of Zion, and D. Thomas Lancaster, the Director of Education. What's up, you guys? Hey, Jacob. <laughs> Jacob, nice to be here again. Good. Oh, it's good to have you back. You know, the, the, everybody loves you guys when you're on. So I think, um, and and everybody loves the the prophetic significance of the feasts. In fact, I think it was like one of the first clues to me that there was something really neat going on in the Old Testament was, um, you know, like watching old Zola Levitt VHS tapes. Do you guys remember that guy? Well, yeah, yeah. The whole idea that Jesus was crucified on Passover is like, okay, everybody knows that. But then I think it was like one of the first that there's all these traditional Jewish observances that are connected, you know, like, oh, the matzah is striped and it's pierced and, uh, you know, the afikoman that goes away and comes and comes back. All these, all the little things it would, it would be a whole nother episode to talk about those. Well, we talk about those at Passover, maybe. <laughs> yeah, we'll talk about them at Passover. But um, what I never got as deep into until I started looking, um, looking at First Fruits of Zion stuff long ago, was that there's a whole bunch going on with the fall festivals as well. Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur, and Sukkot are all just packed, not just what you find in the Bible, but the Jewish tradition is, is just packed full of stuff that um, it clues us in as to what's coming in uh, sometimes very specific ways. So real quick for just in case this is anyone's first encounter with Messiah podcast, we're talking about biblical festivals or Jewish festivals like Passover and all these things, Rosh Hashanah, which is just Hebrew term that maybe people don't know about. Who wants to jump in and and give maybe a, a short introduction to what what is this? What is the biblical calendar or the Jewish calendar? Why is the biblical calendar the Jewish calendar? Why aren't we using a biblical calendar? What's 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 going on here? Well, the biblical calendar is laid out in the Torah in the five books of Moses. Um, a really good place to find uh, where these this calendar. Uh, is explained is in Leviticus 23. And it, there are appointed times of meeting between God and Israel where God says, on this month, on this day of the month, I want you to have a meeting together and I have this uh, task for you to complete, this mitzvah for you to do or, or commandment for you to observe. And uh, it really just sort of uh, describes in a prophetic way, the relationship between God and Israel and their mission in the world. It relates a lot to the agricultural cycle, uh, which is significant because Israel's purpose is to inhabit the land of Israel and cultivate that land. That's all a part of the promise of being rescued from Egypt. Of course, being rescued from Egypt, it has its own festival on its own. So all of this goes together with the mission of Israel in the world and the uh, mission of redemption that God has for all of humanity. And so as we kind of explore like the the prophetic significance of this and that. Um, it might sound like a stretch, but it, it's really kind of baked into the whole idea of the festivals that they're telling a story of God's working through his people, Israel. Yeah, even the word festivals that we're using to describe these things, saying, you know, the the biblical festivals or the festivals uh, that, that God gives to Israel, uh, the Hebrew word behind that is moed or moedim in the plural. So this word actually doesn't mean festival per se, not like in, in English, which festival is derived from the word feast, uh, which implies, you know, 
a big banquet or something like that. Uh, instead, uh, the the Hebrew uh, idea behind this is that these are God's appointed times, and that's even the way that the New American Standard renders it. It says in at the head of Leviticus 23, which Aaron just referenced there, it says, speak to the sons of Israel and say to them, the Lord's appointed times, which you shall proclaim as holy convocations. My appointed times are these. So that kind of bags this idea of what's an appointed time. And we also speak of the tabernacle as the tent of meeting or the tent of appointment. That's the same word. So it it kind of, uh, I guess the idea is that these are times that God designated for Israel to draw near and to meet with him in holy space and holy time, just like the the Sabbath is is one of these. The the seventh day Sabbath is an appointed time that comes every week. It's like it's a festival every week where God says, This is holy time for you to set aside for me to meet with me. Hmm. So it sounds like there's a couple of layers going on with this with this calendar. It is on the on the on the very surface, it looks like an agricultural calendar with some harvest festivals and stuff. But like well, immediately, what you see is that these are also holy times and remembrances of uh, points in Israel's history where God intervened miraculously. And um, and then there's another layer which I think is going to be of great interest to our listeners, which is this idea that they somehow foreshadow or foretell uh the future i mean that's what every when i was growing up that's what everyone was was talking about it was all the left behind books were coming out they made a movie with with nicholas cage for heaven's sake i mean it was a big deal um trying to pin like figure out when the rapture was going to happen and um we're going to get to that we're going to get to prophetic hints in the festivals all right. Well, before we dive into all the specifics of Rosh Hashanah, and I, and I didn't tell either of you that I was going to do this, but uh, why don't you both take a crack at telling someone what Rosh Hashanah is if they've never heard of Rosh Hashanah before? All right. So Rosh Hashanah means head of the year. So it's the Jewish New Year. It's the Jewish New Year, uh, and it comes in September, October-ish, on the lunar calendar, it's the first day of Tishrei, the month that we call Tishrei. Uh, and on Rosh Hashanah, we hear the trumpet blown. We hear the sound of the shofar. We hear the trumpet blown, and it reminds us of certain things from the Bible, important ideas from the Bible. It reminds us about the... Uh, the coming judgment. And on Rosh Hashanah, since it's the new year, it's sort of the, uh, the, the beginning we're preparing for the coming year. And so we spend the day uh, in the synagogue and prayer and, um, and, and asking God to forgive us for, for our sins uh, and, and looking forward to the, the, the coming year and asking him for a good judgment for the coming year. So it's sort of a day of judgment. It's a day in court, uh, but the courtroom is the heavenly courtroom. Uh, and so we say to one another, uh, may you be inscribed for a sweet new year, uh, because we want the heavenly court to inscribe us for a good new year in the book of life uh, for the coming year. That's my thumbnail sketch of Rosh Hashanah. Maybe Aaron can do better. <laughs> no, that's a, a good good description of what Rosh Hashanah is like today. It's both a solemn day and also a day of celebration. Uh, and there's a lot of food involved. We sit around at the table and have, uh, have we get to bring out the nice fall foods. We, we put on uh, nice clothing, uh, dress up. And we spend a lot of time in the synagogue as well. But uh, we, one of the classic things we do is we dip an apple in honey. We use uh, these traditions as a, a kind of an expression of prayer that God would make our uh, our year sweet. Um, and uh, it's a it's good family time as well. It goes back to the agricultural uh, agricultural year. It connects to um, our prayer that God would would bless us agriculturally. Nowadays, we apply it really more in the in in our modern economy um, that uh, we're looking forward to being blessed with with financial health and with with physical health and with spiritual health. 
And so it's more introspective and not so much, a, uh, in my experience, no, not so much really a feeling of, of fear or of, of judgment, but more of a uh, hope of what we want this year to be like. When we, when we get into the granular detail of what happens in a Jewish festival, um, the, uh, the astute listener will find that not all of these details appear in the Bible. And so I'm sure someone will be wondering, well, okay, is, is some of this stuff just made up? You know, like uh, you know, go, going and th throwing rocks in a river to represent uh, your, your sins being hidden away or, or forgiven or something like that that's not in the bible anywhere how can how can we take any of this stuff this stuff that's not in the bible and say well this is like a this is a prophetic foreshadowing like this is something that that tells us something real about the future time of uh, of judgment and redemption the if you we were to just to, to take what the bible says at face value the we would have almost nothing on this holiday, because if you there, there are two places that talk about it really um, in the Torah, uh, Leviticus twenty three, uh, right around verse twenty four, it talks. It says, uh, "In the seventh month, on the first day of the of the month, you shall observe a day of solemn rest." And then it says, "A memorial proclaimed with blast of trumpets, a holy convocation." But the thing is, the actually the word trumpets act, isn't even in Hebrew. That's something that ESV supplied based on Jewish tradition, um, ironically enough. Um, so it says a, mem a memorial of sounding. It doesn't even say what sound it is. Um, and then the other place that you'll find it is in N Numbers 29. In verse 1, it's, it says something very similar. On the first day of the seventh month, you have a holy convocation. Um, you shall not do any ordinary work. It's a day Again, they translate it as a day for you to blow the trumpets, but in Hebrew, it really just says a day of sounding. It shall be a day of sounding for you. And even the word uh, convocation, it's not exactly clear uh, what that means. The Numbers goes on to describe the, the sacrifices that are to be brought in the temple on that day. But other than that, you're not getting, we're not getting much at all. We don't get a, a description of what it means or what else to do. If you're, if it's a convocation, we're supposed to gather together. What do we do when we get together? And there, you know, so all of that, whether it's the blowing of the ram's horn shofar, uh, whether it's dipping an apple in honey, uh, or even the meaning of the day, what it's supposed to s symbolize to us on a face value level or on a very deep and mystical level, all of that ended up having to be something that the Jewish people dis discovered and derived by observing it. Um, now, like, what is what is it? Like, w well, th when you compare the verses together through through uh, some some uh, some comparisons and also through the natural cycle, um, you're able to to discover some things about it. First of all, it happens right at the beginning of the agricultural cycle. This is where it begins uh, the process of preparing your your fields for the next planting and so on, and. In agrarian society, this is a very big deal, and you're sitting here thinking about how how are are, are my crops going to do? Um, uh, are they going to to survive uh, through the winter and such? Are, there, are we going to get enough rain? Uh, it, the amount of rain really affects dramatically the the amount of of harvest at the end of the year, and the Bible specifically tells us that the rain is something that the that the that the heavens provide as a response to Israel's faithfulness. So there's a, immediately there's this connection between are we in good standing with God and and then are we going to then be blessed with a, a bountiful harvest or are we in trouble with God and we need to worry about our um, our, our 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 future income. Um, and so that just uh, automatically becomes the the meaning of it based on where it's situated in the year. Now, when we have a crying out, and the word uh, that for sounding implies a kind of a, an alarm sound, a a, a crying sound, a, a a a sound of of warning. And so, why would there be this sound of warning, a sound of crying? It's because we're concerned, and we ought to be concerned that we're in good standing with God, hmm. so that our our uh, our, the heavens will be open to us, and the the ground will yield its produce. Um, that's the that's ultimately on a face value level what you're going to get. But uh, it still requires stepping into the shoes of the Israelites and experiencing that holiday as a people 
and uh, going beyond just simply what the text says at face value. It sounds like that there's it's not really that much of a jump from seeing Rosh Hashanah as this time where you're preparing the fields and and hoping everything goes and praying everything goes well for the the harvest in the spring to this idea today you know this sort of exile or diaspora idea that on Rosh Hashanah um, you know the books are opened and God decides whether you're going to live or die before the next Rosh Hashanah and he decides how much money you're going to make before the next Rosh Hashanah um, which I think you know, when people first hear that they're like what you know can't wh why is he deciding that all at that like at that time can't he change his mind later or whatever but uh, or why does he need to decide it every year when you see the, the the end from the beginning but when you think about it in terms of the agricultural cycle I guess it makes sense because that's where you're putting your chips down in the fall when you sow your winter wheat and then you're like you're hoping and praying for the best because th at that point you're sort of locked in you've spent your money to buy your seed and whatever is that yeah exactly that's exactly right and so then the rainy season is going to start after the festivals conclude after the festival of Sukkot is when the rainy season in the land of Israel begins and depending on how much precipitation the land of Israel is going to receive over that coming rainy season that's going to determine the outcome of the year for you and so that's why this becomes a new year that's how this uh this festival gets marked as as the new year because it's the new year agriculturally speaking as as Aaron was saying and so everything is hanging on it and I guess as time went on it got wrapped into this uh, this apocalyptic vision of the coming day of the Lord which is also a new year that's the uh, the new age to come and so this kind of like vision of the new age to come uh, is conflated with the new year to come and so that brings us that kind of escalates the whole festival up to that level of uh, judgment, uh, standing in judgment before the throne of God uh, in, in preparation for the, the punishment or the reward that you have earned over the previous year. I like to think of it as sort of a um, tax day, you know, two things are true in life, right? The, there's two things that are certain is death and taxes. Well, this is sort of like the end of the fiscal year for our deeds mm. uh, in, in the eyes of heaven. And so at the end of the fiscal year, there's an accounting that's made. And depending on the accounting that's made, that's how the next year is going to be measured out. That's the essential idea of the high holidays of Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. You know, it reminds me of... Uh... You know the parables where that uh, Jesus told, where the master goes away, like he gives you something, he gives a servant some so talent, and he goes away and comes back, and the ones who did well they get more talents, and the ones who did really poorly get get nothing, um, something like that. You know, but yeah, there's so many parables, so many of the parables of of Yeshua can are just like they're almost as if they're sermon illustrations from high holiday high holiday sermons the whole, the whole theme of this season is repentance like we're in this season as we're coming up on Rosh Hashanah here in the in the final uh, weeks here before the festival begins while we're recording this. Uh, we're in a season that's called the season of Teshuvah, the season of repentance, where we're preparing ourselves to stand before the king on this day of judgment, the day of Rosh Hashanah and 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 the day of Yom Kippur, the, the day of atonement. And uh, the, the tradition is that there's three things that we do to prepare ourselves for this upcoming uh, encounter with the Almighty and the the verdict in the books of of judgment, and that is uh, charity, prayer, and repentance. Giving charity, spending time in prayer and petition. Uh, that's prayers called slichot that are like essentially uh, petitions, uh, apologies before heaven for, for you know, repentance and, and you know confessions of sin. Ask asking God to have mercy and to forgive our sin, not just our personal sin either, but but this but the whole nation and and to to have mercy on the whole world. And then uh so so prayer, repentance and teshuva, repentance, that's rectifying the wrongs that we've done. It's not just feeling bad about our sins, but it's actually like 
you know, connecting with people that we may have hurt uh, in the previous year and uh, apologizing where apologies are are due and and changing course and redirecting our lives according to uh, the standards that are in God's Word uh, rather than just going our own way. If we've been backsliding, it's time to slide forward a little bit. Uh, that's what repentance is all about. So that's the theme for the festivals, really. Mm. And you can see that uh, you said prayer, repentance and charity, tefillah, uh, tshuva tzedakah. Um, you can see that pattern um, in uh, in the teachings of, of Yeshua in Matthew chapter six, he, he lists in that, in in, in sequence, uh, rule, his, his instructions regarding uh, giving uh, charity to the poor, concerning how to pray, concerning how to fast. Fasting in in, in Jewish thought is very very closely related to repentance. It's uh, it's connected together. Um, so and and I think how many times did he um, use agricultural metaphors to refer to this process of redemption, of sowing and reaping and things like that. Um, so it's it is it's it's very very thematic in the Gospels and in the teachings of Yeshua. He's talking about forgiving others so that our Father in heaven will forgive us our sins. That's a holiday idea. Oh, it That's is. the idea of, of rectifying these relationships and extending forgiveness so that we will be forgiven. That's completely a high holiday idea right out of Jewish tradition for how the festivals of Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur are to be observed, how they're to be uh, internalized and celebrated. Yeah, and I, and I think that the way you've described it, it is not just um, like a quivering in fear, although there's an aspect of that, it's not just you know, most, most. I don't know if most, but a lot of Christians, when they think of judgment, they think um, first of all, they think oh, it's not going to happen to me because I got Jesus. But second of all, it's like it's a scary thing, like uh, you know, scarier than giving an oral report. You know, you got if you you have to go up and explain all your sins and what you did and stuff. I mean, it's it's just it's harshness and it's all. Uh, I don't know, you know, there's there's a potential downside to being judged. And certainly there's an aspect of that, you know, God is a consuming fire and everything. But I think as I've looked into Judaism, there's also, like you talked about, repentance, reconciliation with other people. There's this aspect of um, a restoration of a relationship. I remember hearing that um, Elul, the month before Rosh Hashanah, is an acronym is interpreted as an acronym for Ani Ladodi Vidodi Li, or I am my beloved's and my beloved's or my beloved is mine, sort of um, indicating that what's supposed to be happening in the lead up to Rosh Hashanah is, uh, you know, restoration, reconnection, reestablishment of harmonious relationship between Israel and God and, and, between people and other people, so it's it's not all f fear of of hellfire and judgment, right? I mean, there's it's maybe maybe two sides to this thing. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I I think of uh, the the parable of the prodigal son all the time um, in relation to Rosh Hashanah. It's it's coming back into relationship with God. It, if you're, it, you know, the, what dep what matters is your 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 decisions in regards to uh repentance i mean if you if you do repent then that's great <laughs> you do you end up uh following god's call to be in relationship with with him again and to have your sins forgiven and so on um it's the it's the person who doesn't hear that it doesn't want to repent that's the one who's going to have to face up to the the uh the more harsh side of things hmm. Yeah, you know, the whole idea of standing in judgment, that is the essential uh, biblical concept of the fear of the Lord, you know, that uh, God rewards God rewards uh, righteousness, he punishes sin. So when you might say he rewards repentance, he punishes sin. And that's something that, you know, even, even if we are, you know, solid in our faith, steadfast in our faith in Yeshua, that uh, there is no condemnation for those who are in the Messiah, Yeshua. Nevertheless, uh, there's also what Paul says, that we must all stand before the judgment seat of Messiah. We must all give it an accounting. Now, that's not, that's not actually what's happening on Rosh Hashanah. Uh, on Rosh Hashanah, we're talking about an annual judgment uh, for 
life in this world. <laughs> you know, yeah. it's more it's more mundane. It's not the final judgment on Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. Uh, and I think people get confused. I think they put those two things together and they think that that this is what's actually happening. Uh, it's not what's actually happening. We're talking about our life in this world is being decided for one year, for 12 months on Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. It's sort of an annual rehearsal for the big final eschatological judgment where our life for the world to come is going to be decided in in the final judgment at the judgment seat of Messiah, where we will be facing the, uh, a future destiny uh, for life in the world to come. That would be to be sealed in the book of life uh, in, in the end times judgment, or to be sealed in the book of death, the other alternative uh, that you don't want in the end times judgment. And so it's like I mean, it's kind of like I would liken it to if you were in, if you can think back to high school or college, before the big test, your teacher would hit you with a lot of quizzes. Maybe a, maybe you'd have a quiz every week. And if you were if you were scoring well on the quizzes, you were fairly confident that you could score well when the test finally came. But if you were if you were poor, scoring very poorly on the quizzes, that meant you really you know you you were going to be in trouble when that test came. So if if we consider the the festivals of the high holidays specifically of of Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur to be like that weekly quiz. Uh, the idea is to remind us that there is a final test coming, and the final test is is really what's going to be the 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 thing that counts for eternity. Mm. Yeah, another good good parallel you could see is as one's yearly review with their employer, where you know you get your stuff together and say, "Hey, here's what I've done this year. Here's what I've accomplished for the company. Um, here is uh, you know, and and hopefully your your." Uh, your boss is going to say, "Oh, great! Well, you're due for a raise." Or, but they might also say, um, "I think we're not going to extend your employment." You know, God forbid. It could be uh, one or the one or the other, or somewhere in between. You don't necessarily go into your yearly review, though, in in fear and trembling, unless you you know that uh, you you haven't really performed well um, for yeah, the company. Got some pink slips. Huh? It could be a great opportunity for all for all uh, for all you know. Yeah. So, and I think this is something. This is something that um, that I became real interested in once I started looking at at the Jewish conception of Rosh Hashanah, because the only place I knew about God opening books and ju- and and reading the things that people have done and making judgments, the only context I had for that was the New Testament. And then when I started hearing that, you know, in in Jewish tradition this is happening every year, I almost had to start to say, oh, okay, what came first and what, uh, how, is, how is one informing the other? And I think you just explained it really well. There's a, there's a yearly thing that happens where God decides what's going to happen for the next year based on what you did the previous year. And this is hinting or foreshadowing or, and preparing people for the final judgment, which looks very similar but is obviously the stakes are much higher. Is that about right? Yeah, that's it. It's nice to have that uh, that yearly reminder uh, to so in, and to take things in small increments. It's better for us in the long term because we can stay in the mindset of you know what we're going to have to make an accounting um, when all this is said and done. Well, that's one of the great things about the the biblical calendar or the Jewish calendar is you get weekly stuff. That keeps you sort of thinking about the world to come and you get monthly stuff and you get yearly stuff and you get every seven years stuff and every 49 years. Stuff. I mean, there's there's all of these different <laughs> cycles uh, to sort of keep you on track, at least keep you thinking about um, your relationship with Hashem and, and uh, you know, what's really going on in, in your life. You know, what's the what's your purpose for being here? So one thing that interested me and that it, it maybe confused me was okay we have there's obviously this big trumpet theme for Rosh Hashanah so obviously the thing to do if you're thinking okay Jesus died and and came back from the dead around this Passover festival uh Rosh Hashanah is all about trumpets can we go into the New Testament where it's you know or in the Old Testament and find prophecies of the end of time you know which we're all 
some of us are very foolishly looking fo forward to with great eagerness, even, I mean, even though that's, it's, uh, I think I'm pretty sure there's a prophet who says this is, it's not going to be a good time, um, for at least, at least, uh, for a while. But we, you know, we all, we all want to see justice prevail and we all want to see our, our, our master again. And, and so, you know, there's this aching for the restoration of all things. And so we're thinking, all right, now that we know that Rosh Hashanah is connected somehow to this final judgment prophetically, first of all, it, can we say that it, there's a high probability that some important eschatological or end time events will actually happen around that time of the year? And second of all, this final trumpet, there's too many trumpets, all right? There's too many trumpets <laughs> happening in the New Testament. You got Paul talking about the last trump, and but then you got in Revelation, there's like at least seven trumpets. So what can we glean from the trumpet stuff? The, in the traditional uh, ram's horn trumpet, it's called a shofar. You know, in in Judaism, we we hear the shofar on Rosh Hashanah. It's actually interesting. It's not even a, a considered in Jewish law. It's not considered a mitzvah to blow the trumpet on Rosh Hashanah. It's a mitzvah to hear the trumpet blown oh. on Rosh Hashanah. So it's not as if uh, Jewish people all show up to the synagogue and and take a turn blowing the trumpet or everybody brings their own trumpet or something like that. There's one person who's designated to blow the trumpet in the synagogue on Rosh Hashanah. He blows it a hundred times, right? And and so you hear these hundred blasts of the trumpet over the course of the liturgy. And uh, the, the, the sages have identified various various things that the trumpet of Rosh Hashanah is supposed to remember. And this, these are all hung on scripture, different different scripture verses where it says, it uses, it says uh, we see a trumpet here in this passage and a trumpet there in that passage. And some of them are a little obscure. Like for example, we say, okay, on Rosh Hashanah, we hear the trumpet uh, blown in the synagogue on Rosh Hashanah in order to remember uh, the binding of Isaac, the story of the binding of Isaac in Genesis 22. Why? Because uh, in Genesis 22, instead of sacrificing his son Isaac, Abraham sacrificed a ram. And what does a ram have? A ram has two horns. The ram was caught in the thicket by its horns in that story. And so uh, that's what the trumpet is about. Okay, uh, here's another answer. Uh, no, the trumpet on Rosh Hashanah is about the end of the exile of the Jewish people, that there's going to be this great redemption at the at the end of the story. As it says in the prophet Isaiah, it will come about in that day that a great trumpet will be blown, and those who are perishing in the land of Assyria and those who are scattered in the land of Egypt will come and worship the Lord in the, whole, in, in the holy mountain, uh, th that's the temple, at Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. You know, so this is, here's another answer that in the final, there's going to be a final redemption. When the Messiah comes, he's going to sound the great shofar. He's going to sound the trumpet. And this is what, you know, we see in the New Testament. That's what the master is referring to when he says uh, the, the angels, uh, the son of man will come with his angels and the great blast of a trumpet and gather the elect from the four corners of the earth. That's, you know, gathering in those who are perishing in the land of Assyria, those who are scattered in the land of Egypt. Uh, or that, this is what Paul is referring to when he says that, at the at the last trump, we will all be transformed and and and, and we'll be with the Messiah. Uh, and and then the book of Revelation you mentioned takes these. You've got these seven trumps, but it's like this is just an eschatological sequence that's leading us up to that last trumpet. That seventh trumpet is the trumpet of Messiah. So the final trump is in a spiritual sense, in a uh, symbolic sense connected with the trumpet of the Feast of Trumpets or, or Rosh Hashanah. Is it also going to happen on Rosh Hashanah? Is this is the final trump going to come on Rosh Hashanah? Or can we not necessarily say that for sure? Well, no one knows the day or hour, Jacob. Right. We should we should be constantly uh, expecting it. This is the this is the thing we uh, the trumpet is symbolic and who knows it could happen on uh rosh hashanah or it could happen on many any other holiday there is a but there's an expectation you should have at every day you should be expecting that uh, messiah is going to come that uh, elijah is going to announce his arrival you can't just say well it's only you know we got a few days at least so i can um i can alleviate my expectations uh in the meantime 
But everything that that needs to happen has happened. It's sort of like the saying of Rabbi Eliezer: uh, "On what day shall you should you repent? You should repent one day before you die, right?" Yeah, that's a good point. So I wonder. I mean, I just thought of this. It's probably not correct, but um, you don't know what day Rosh Hashanah is going to be because it's the first day of Tishri, right? You don't know what day is going to be Rosh Hashanah. You got to wait for someone to tell you hey, the Sanhedrin saw the new moon and it's Rosh Hashanah today. So it could be a surprise, even if you know what the day on the calendar it's going to be. I don't know. Imagine what things were like back in the days when a long time ago, as you as you alluded to, uh, you didn't you couldn't just have a calendar to figure out what day things would would fall. You know, you couldn't say, oh, well, it looks like April 14th is going to be Passover. Uh, first of all, because, you know, they didn't. That's the Roman calendar. In the same yeah. Way. But um but uh, well, you can't just say it's going to be in a certain number of days because the months are determined by seeing the new moon. Uh, witnesses saw the new moon. They go to the court. The court uh, declares, they, they inter interrogate the witness to, to tell if they're telling the truth or what, how, what did they see or if they just saw a cloud that looked like the moon or something like that. And uh, and then they declare that a moon uh, or a month has started. Uh, and then that will set that that month's holidays. So uh, in the springtime, they will declare, "Oh, that uh, the month of Nisan started." Now you know how many days it is until Passover, as you're describing here with this the, this holiday that occurs on the first day of the month, the day that they declare that uh, witness of the new moon was was correct is the first day of Tishrei of the of, and it ends up being the day of Rosh Hashanah. The problem is that by the time that that uh, witness testifies before the court, most of the day has already gone by. Wow. <laughs> and so you didn't you had to assume that today is Rosh Hashanah for a long time uh, and then when uh, when the the court declares that it already has been the uh, Rosh Hashanah you have you know you know you you know that your your celebration hasn't been in vain however it could be that the the court will say well no it turns out we didn't get anyone who saw the moon today so Rosh Hashanah is going to be tomorrow um, so it's because it's either going to be on the on the 30th day or on the on the 31st day since the month is going to be 29 or 30 days long mm. so uh so yeah they had an issue where it was confusing for a while where people would observe the holiday kind of preemptively and then uh witnesses would 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 come and then they, but they would be rejected and so on and by the end of the day um it was too late to to do the the Rosh Hashanah sacrifices so they say they said all right that's it we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna wait until tomorrow uh tomorrow will be rosh hashanah and then people thought okay fine it's not a holiday anymore i can go and just do some grocery shopping and and whatever i need to do but then their concern was that uh in future years people would not take that first day seriously at all and it would turn out that it was the holiday and they they were only half observing it so that's how the, it ended up being that Rosh Hashanah was always observed for two days. And to this day in the Jewish community or in, you look at a calendar, Rosh Hashanah is always observed for two days because of that very issue that you're not ever quite sure if it's Rosh Hashanah yet or not. However, today we can we it, the calendar is calculated in advance um, because we don't have a system where we can do that observation by the moon and the court that can declare um, the the months. So. Uh, but we 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 still observe the the holiday as two days as it was done in biblical times. Interesting. So be ready every day, even if it's not Rosh Hashanah, because you know maybe maybe you're wrong. Maybe it is going to happen today. Okay. So the next the next uh, holy day on the Jewish calendar after Rosh Hashanah is connected, right? Because on Rosh Hashanah, like we said, the books are open and there's this judgment thing, but a lot of people aren't in this book where, oh, everything's great, you're solid, or in the book that's like, oh, you did terrible, you're dead. A lot of people, it's like, well, there's a, they're a mixture. There's some good, there's some bad. And then, so, so you get 10 more days to get your act together, right? Is that about the size and the shape of it? And then 10 days after Rosh Hashanah is Yom Kippur, and that's when... The, all of us who are sort of in the middle, not perfectly righteous, not uh, not 100% sinful, 
that uh, the book of the of everyone else is opened and, the, and a final judgment is made for them on the yearly Rosh Hashanah thing. Um, is that right? Yom Kippur is the time where there's that uh, some more judgment? Yes. To put it into the terminology that the, the synagogue liturgy uses, uh, what happens is that an initial judgment is executed on Rosh Hashanah for everyone. Everybody's deeds are scrutinized and reviewed, and everybody's written in one of these uh, one of these books, one of three books, theoretically. Uh, one is the Book of Life, and, and if you're in the Book of Life, that's good news because you're going to have a good year, at least, at least you're, you know, at least you're going to be alive for another 12 months. If you're in the Book of Death, not so much. Uh, but in most people fall into, like you said, into that in-between category. And so that's called the book of the in-between or the, the, the book of the pretty good, uh, but, not, but not completely good. Uh, but uh, you can't have a judgment that's based on, you know, pr- you know pretty good. There's no, there's, no, there's no, even in eschatology, there's no uh, realm of the pretty good. You know, you don't like, you don't have uh, the godly and the saintly going to the world to come and the wicked going to Gehenna, there's there's no in-between pretty good place where the, yeah. the pretty good people go. So <laughs> Free the ice be- cream, but only once a month. Yeah, yeah right. So, so, so in these, the, the in-betweeners need to be sorted. They need to be sorted into, are you headed for the book of life or the book of death? Because that's the only two options you get. The switch is only in two positions. You know, it's, a, mm. it's, it's either up or it's down. And so the idea is that uh, you'll you have um, these ten days to influence the court, to 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 prevail upon the court, and to to plead for clemency and to beg for mercy, and and that's really the idea of what's going on 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 Yom Kippur. You come to the Day of Atonement, and you're asking God, atone for me, provide atonement for me. I realize that I don't deserve, I don't merit a place in the Book of Life that my sins are probably, you know, sending me in the other direction. Uh, but you're a merciful king and a merciful father. And so on, on Yom Kippur, the idea is that whatever the judgment is, the judgment is going to be sealed by the court by the end of the day. So there is a deadline. There's an absolute mm. deadline. But up until the court seals that, until that notary public you know, comes down on it uh, and, and notarizes what the judgment is, there's still the chance that you can influence the heavenly court to grant you clemency in your, as, they review, as they review your case. And so what we say on, as we come up to Rosh Hashanah, say, we say, may you be inscribed for a sweet new year. May you be inscribed in the book of life for a sweet new year. But once Rosh Hashanah has come, then we, we change the language and we say, the greeting is, may you be sealed uh, in the book of life. Mm. Uh, so on Rosh Hashanah, we are inscribed, but it's written in pencil. Mm. <laughs> on Yom Kippur, you're sealed. It's written in pen, okay? The, okay? the verdict is written in pen. So that's kind of the idea. So it's like there's there's actually a 10-day deliberation uh, between the two festivals of Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. And that's why we call them the high holidays. Uh, they're connected. They're absolutely connected to each other. So that's the yearly cycle. That's what happens every year. What is the eschatological implication of that? Because we've been talking about the last trump, Rosh Hashanah, the books are opened, everyone gets judged. Is there an eschatological parallel to the idea of uh, a short period of time where maybe everything's hanging in the balance and maybe you can prevail upon the court? I don't think it's there's necessarily has to be a one to one correspondence uh, distinguishing between the Rosh Hashanah event of eschatology and the Yom Kippur event of eschatology. Rather, these are all together taken together. That's a that's a snapshot of the uh, apocalyptic expectation of the final judgment. Uh, But nevertheless, you could make some. We can we can make some correlations. Uh, The the trumpet of Rosh Hashanah correlates to the coming of the Messiah at the beginning of the kingdom. And so there's a kingdom era that, that we call the millennium or the thousand years, the days of Messiah, the messianic era, that 
that then occurs before the world to come in the final judgment. The final judgment uh, stands at the beginning of the world to come. It says, I saw a new heaven and a new earth and so forth. Mm. And this is all laid out for us in Revelation chapter 20. Uh, So that's where I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne of the Lord. That would correspond then uh, to uh, the, the Day of Atonement, to to Yom Kippur. So there you have, right there, you have two eschatological events, the coming of the Messiah with the sounding of a trumpet at the beginning of the Messianic era, and then uh, Yom Kippur, the day of the Lord, so to speak, the final judgment at the conclusion of the Messianic era and the outset of the world to come. How's that? Sure. That's what I know. I think uh, because there is, there's, there's a bunch of stuff that happens on either end of the messianic era. All right. Well, before the messianic era, before the glorious, you know, parousia, the second coming where uh, Jesus makes everything great again, there's, there's a period of time that no one, no one in their right mind is looking forward to, which is, it's there. It's there in the old Testament prophecies. It's there quite graphically in revelation and it's just usually referred to as the tribulation or the great tribulation Uh, in judaism i've heard it called the birth pangs of the messiah and it's just a real bad time for everybody here on planet earth is there anything uh, that we can learn about the tribulation from the fall festivals or anything we can learn about this rapture i've heard so much about where we're supposed to be uh caught up in the air and maybe avoid some of this stuff oh the rapture question okay all right well um i'm gonna say no uh there's the the festivals of rosh hashanah yom kippur are not there to teach us about the tribulation that's not really the the idea but the the tribulation is very much part and parcel of jewish eschatology and uh, apocalyptic expectation of jewish eschatology the, the, that's called in, in Judaism, that's called the birth pains of Messiah, that before the coming of the Messiah, there is this period of travail that's expected, that's going to be uh, a, a, a difficult time that the, the whole world will go through uh, leading up to the revelation of Messiah. And of course, this is, this is alluded to several times in the New Testament. It's actually, uh, Yeshua says, explicitly says uh, these various uh, famines and earthquakes and uh, wars and rumors of war and and so forth. These are the beginning of the birth pangs, uh, and that's a direct reference to Jewish Jewish eschatology. So, so I guess that kind of wraps into the idea of the coming of Messiah. But it's not really so much a high holiday theme, except that the the sound of the shofar is supposed to be a warning that we should be we should be uh, on the alert, paying attention to the prophets. That's one of the things we're supposed to remember when the shofar sounds on Rosh Hashanah is that that there, you know, in the ancient world, the shofar was used as a civil defense siren, so to speak. So uh, if a shofar is sounded in the city, uh, will the people not take warning, it says in Amos. And that's one of the things we then remember on the festival of Rosh Hashanah, that the words of the prophets should be warning us that there is this this time of difficulty to come and we should be preparing then, you know, the answer is again with repentance. So uh, as far as the rapture goes, yeah, you know, why not? Let's all get raptured. Uh, but th- <laughs> there's, in, in Jewish eschatology, the rapture is called the ingathering of the exiles. It has a different name. It's called the ingathering of the exiles. And the idea is that the exiles are, the Messiah is to come. And the, his, his first job on arrival is to gather in the exiles of Israel back to the land of Israel. And so I guess you could say that's Jewish eschatology's version of of the rapture. And whether that happens through catching up in the air or everybody booking a flight on LL, that remains to be seen. But uh, it's it's going to be something something alike, something like that. Okay. Well, uh, what about people who aren't Jewish? Are they going to fly somewhere? Or Well, Paul, Paul says to the Corinthians, who is, and when he's writing to the people in Corinth, he's writing to a mixed audience, right? He's, he's writing, mm-hmm. but primarily to, he's, he's the apostle to the Gentiles. He says, we will all be caught up together with them uh, 
to to meet the master, to meet Messiah, the, the Messiah in the air. So there's this expectation that uh, he says, you know, all the disciples of Yeshua are going to be uh, gathered uh, in this this event. Uh, so for sure, uh, it's it's a Jewish expectation. It's about it's it's about the end of exile. That's the whole point of it. But mm. the servants of King Messiah, the servants of the king, are also going to be gathered in the vanguard. I think it's essential there, though, to note though that the that the gathering is not to being gathered into heaven to avoid the birth pains of Messiah. The they're being gathered into the kingdom, into the into the land of Israel, and um, and that's av- after having already ex- endured. Uh, all the difficulties leading up to the Messiah's coming. There's no ticket out of here, uh, like a pre-trib rapture type of thing in Jewish eschatology. That just is isn't isn't happening, and it's not happening in the New Testament either. Yeah, and I think that's one area where I found I had to revise what I thought because I was raised, you know, a pre-trib dispensationalist, and in dispensationalism, a lot of people. Uh, who gravitate toward Messianic Judaism come from dispensationalism. In dispensationalism, there's this idea that the Jewish people have to go through this tribulation because they didn't recognize Messiah, and then the church gets to avoid it or avoid some of it, hopefully, because they they don't need they don't need to go through that uh, judgment because they did accept Messiah. Whereas what we believe, and hopefully I get this right, is there at least how I've come to think of it, is that by joining together with Israel to worship the God of Israel, to submit to the Messiah of Israel, our destiny is connected to the destiny of Israel, and we are in a sense in exile with Israel. We're we're not literally in the sense that we have we have countries and nations and so forth that. But when we decide the Messiah is our king, there's a sense in which we're not in that kingdom, so we're exiles. And to me, that makes more sense. We're, we're, it's, there's, it brings a sense of solidarity with the Jewish people, whatever they go through, and, and, and we're going through it as well. And uh, I don't know, that feels more right to me than thinking that we're going to get to to go on vacation while our our brothers in Israel are uh, suffering, right? Yeah, Baruch Shem. You know, it says um, in in the prophet uh, Zechariah, many peoples and mighty nations will come to seek the Lord of hosts in Jerusalem and to entreat the favor of the Lord. Thus says the Lord of hosts, in those days, 10 men from all the nations will grasp the, grasp the garment of a Jew saying, let us go with you. For we have heard that God is with you. That's how the prophets depict this in gathering, uh, and and so we can see even even back here in the Tanakh, there was this idea that there would be those from the nations who are participating in the in gathering of Israel back to the land of Israel, back to Jerusalem to entreat the favor of the Lord. Nice. Well, that at least is something we can all look forward to. That final in gathering and the great party at the end of time. There's, if I'm not mistaken, Dan, you actually wrote a book that goes into quite a bit more detail on a lot of this stuff. Can you can you sell our listeners your book really quickly? Oh, yeah. Thank you so much. Uh, so I did write a book that's available through First Fruits of Zion. You can pick up the book by going to our website, ffoz.org. That's F as in first, F as in fruits, O as in of, and Z as in Zion, first fruits of Zion, ffoz.org. You'll find the book there uh, by the title of The Holy Days. And so The Holy Days covers not just Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, but it gives an explanation of what we've been talking about for all of God's appointed times, all of the festivals from the biblical calendar. Fantastic. All right, well, thanks to Aaron and Daniel for joining us today, and thanks for listening to Messiah Podcast. If you're interested in learning more about the Jewish Jesus, check out First Fruits of Zion at ffoz.org. And if you enjoyed this episode, please give us a five-star rating wherever you're listening. Messiah Podcast is made possible by the generosity of our First Fruits of Zion friends. 
FFOZ friends are people like you who support our mission and get loads of exclusive Bible commentary, teaching, and content. You can join today at ffoz.org. Tune in next time for more great conversations. Until then, Shalom. Like the waters cover the sea